As the number of confirmed cases continues to surge worldwide, health experts are really struggling to understand the extent of the damage left behind by COVID-19, the damage left behind to the body. So we're going to bring in Dr. Kanta Ahmed. She's a pulmonologist and an intensive care specialist. And I really appreciate you joining us, doctor, because we're hearing all sorts of things about the impact of the coronavirus um, on not just the lungs, but we're hearing about the liver, we're hearing hearing about the intestinal system, there's just sort of all, uh, many aspects. We're hearing uh, symptoms like people losing their sense of taste and their sense of smell uh, before they, before it's confirmed that they have the coronavirus. So let us start though with the lungs because it's essentially a respiratory illness as we know it. Can you talk to us about what the coronavirus does to the lungs that inevitably um, leads to people dying? So I'm going to speak to you because I have been looking after critically ill patients at NYU Langone. And we do see their major challenge is getting oxygen into the body, which is the work of the lungs. And I believe the virus is impacting that in two different ways. Certainly, the virus in the body, when it's at a level where a patient becomes critically ill, the level is so high, it triggers an intense immune response. And that is very much focused in the lungs and the lungs begin to be very inflamed, concentrating with all kinds of cytokines. Those are molecule messengers telling the immune system where to fight. There are tremendous secretions that are elicited because of that. So the lung becomes difficult to get the oxygen from the ventilator into the body. But the virus is also targeting, we believe, the transport of oxygen. The virus appears to work somewhere inside the red cell and prevents the proper attachment of oxygen to hemoglobin, which is why we're seeing these patients needing extremely high levels of oxygen, but not behaving exactly like other lung diseases. And once these patients become critically ill, then exactly what you just mentioned occurs. We're seeing inflammation in many organs. We're seeing inflammation in the liver. The liver enzymes become deranged. A very important disruption is in the body's coagulation system. So these patients become more predisposed to clotting, particularly. That means that they can form blood clots in the lungs. We're having a tremendous challenge with patients that form blood clots to the uh, brain. And you've heard about the shortages, not only of ventilators, but also of dialysis machines. It particularly seems to injure the kidneys we think not only through the lack of blood supply or lack of oxygen to the kidney, but very much through direct clots in the kidney. And that's been shown, clots in the lungs and clots in the kidney have been shown in autopsy studies. So this is a systemic illness. The question that you asked right at the beginning is one that we as lung specialists are asking. We are wondering how our patients are going to do. Many of them do not get sick enough to be in the intensive care unit, so they, they go home. We're finding that they're still needing oxygen for many weeks. We're wondering how they will be at one month, at three months. And we are planning that we will build um, at NYU Langone COVID clinics where we will begin to follow this group of patients to learn what happens to them and how to help them. Doctor, so this is so fascinating. And I want to see if you will be able to share some practical advice for people um, who may be watching this and either have had family members uh, who have been infected with COVID-19 or they themselves uh, have been infected, or if you're just worried, should you be infected? I I've read a lot of reports of people saying, be because as you pointed out, uh, the testing isn't being done except for people who are extremely sick. So should you be infected with COVID-19? There's a fear that I've read about that people have, which is having to go onto a ventilator or having or, or somehow contracting pneumonia. Are there any kind of breathing exercises or things that people can do to ensure that their lungs stay as healthy as possible while dealing with the trauma of this infection? I mean, I think one thing to do is to reassure all of you uh, watching and listening at home is that we apply the mechanical ventilator, the respirator, at the very last point where we feel there are no other treatment options because uh, we, we know that it is an extremely heroic treatment and it is one that comes with its own complications. But the first thing you can do at home, starting today, stop smoking, stop vaping, things that are injurious. I would even consider discontinuing recreational marijuana that you're inhaling. Anything that irritates the lung 
can make it much more prone to this infection becoming seriously um, uh, uh, taking hold. If you are a patient with pulmonary disease already, make sure that you're in touch with your doctor's office, which many of them are at NYU Langone, we're doing telemedicine. They can communicate with you. Make sure you're taking your medications properly and particularly avoid the risk of contracting the infection. People with lung disease need to stay away from crowds, away from gatherings and observe the precautions. Breathing exercises, I'm not sure uh, that there's any data on that, but it would not harm you uh, to, to take regular walks, to remain somewhat physically active within uh, the realm of possibility as we're restricted. But the vaping and the smoking is very important. I'm seeing serious lung injury in patients who just had a brief period of smoking, just a few years, and anything that's injurious to the lung is going to put us at a disadvantage when we're taking care of you. Man, doctor, that is really good advice. Um, so I, I want to sort of piggyback on what Vlad said and also bring up what you said a little bit earlier when you were describing the impact of the virus. 80% um, of COVID-19 patients that are put on ventilators ultimately die. And as we've been covering this pandemic, that question has been popping up in my head over and over again. Why are being people being put on ventilators? It doesn't seem like it's a very good treatment. And I heard uh, from another doctor, I think, earlier today that the thing about COVID-19 is that in some ways it's similar to uh, altitude sickness. And maybe you sort of suggested something like that when you talked about it maybe having an impact on the way our bodies absorb oxygen. I'm wondering if doctors are taking all, all of that into account and if they're trying anything new other than uh, ventilators? So, I mean, that's, ve that's a very intelligent question. I am very familiar with the statement of the physician you're referring to. Um, I do not think these patients are behaving like high-altitude pulmonary edema, which is what he said. That's where you go up to the base camp mm -hmm. of Everest and have difficulty breathing. Um, but there is a mystery to this illness. And to try and put it very uh, simply, sometimes we can put patients on oxygen and it's somehow not traveling into the circulation. A good example is carbon monoxide poisoning has the same sort of mechanism. And there may be this kind of shunt where oxygen is going into the body, but not really getting out of the lungs into the bloodstream. That is part of the mechanism. And some of our most brilliant minds in our field are busy thinking about this. We must say that uh, we are seeing patients survive mechanical ventilation. Uh, we've had uh, patients, I've personally had in the last uh, three weeks, patients that have been on mechanical ventilators, come off the mechanical ventilators and got ready and gone home. We also have some of the best experience in the country with something called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which we do at NYU Langone in Manhattan and here in Long Island. And that is where we put an artificial, it's like a heart lung machine, but we're using it as an artificial lung machine in addition to the mechanical ventilator, to rest the lungs and assist with oxygen. And we have sent home people having gone through that extraordinary treatment and gone home with relatively normal lungs on no oxygen, on room air. So we're having some incredible hmm. progress thanks to our amazing cardiac surgeons and cardiac critical care colleagues um, here at NYU Langone. That is a very, very heroic measure it is reserved for the sickest patients who are often with extremely severe lung injury that I've not seen in about 30 years. But the questions that you're asking, we are not really going to know the answers to that until well into this experience. And I want to assure people, we are thinking about these patients every hour, every day. We're scratching our heads. We're working with them. We also do not want to put people on ventilators longer than necessary because they have their own set of injuries to the lung that we know very much how to manage. We know how to look after them. But we, at a certain point, cannot deliver oxygen into the body without a ventilator. And all our patients that need it get ventilators. The state and the administration has done a tremendous job getting us mechanical ventilators. We are using our resources very judiciously. We, we have a shortage of dialysis machines, but we can use them. And ECMO is an extremely limited resource, but when someone needs it, we can arrange that and we can do it as we did it this weekend, um, just recently. 
Uh, Dr. Ahmed, this has been so fascinating, I think, for myself and Anne Marie, and certainly I believe it will be also for our viewers. Uh, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all that you do for all of us uh, here uh, in the community keeping us safe. We appreciate it. My pleasure.